Hey everybody, welcome back to our materials informatics series. Let's dive into a case study now for machine learning applied to a materials topic and an exciting one at that, high entropy alloys. If you don't know what these are, if you're not familiar with them, check out the previous video, I'll put it in the link below, where I did an overview of what exactly high entropy alloys are, where did they come from, why are people so excited about them, and what are the sort of unique properties that they bring to the table as a class of interesting materials. In this video, we're going to talk about what's been happening in the literature for machine learning of high entropy alloys, both in predicting phases and in predicting properties. Okay, so let's dive into it. First off, I didn't do this work alone. Special thanks to my grad students, actually, who helped me put this content together for this video. So specifically, Trupti, Hassan, and Ramsey. So special thanks to them for making this possible. Okay, all right. Now, if you're familiar with high entropy alloys, uh, then you know that they very often consist of multiple phases. In fact, that's a lot of the origin of some of their interesting properties. In these materials, you have oftentimes FCC and BCC, relatively simple structures where the many different elements come together and form a random solid solution in that phase. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you have a mixture, and it's not just FCC or BCC. There are certainly some others, but those are the most common ones. And if you zoom in, in the early days of this work, we found that actually a lot of stuff they thought was single phase was actually probably multiple phase in any case. It just looked like they were close to the same because the X-ray spectra was close to the same because the lattice parameter wasn't too different, but you technically did have segregation in two different regions, okay? Uh, the other thing that we know is that when you have different phases, we tend to see some general trends. FCC phases tend to be more ductile, BCC phases tend to be stronger. And so, for example, here in the you know, one of the very first papers, yay, this was the one that was published at the same time as the Cantrell alloy, um, they showed that as you increase the amount of aluminum, even a small amount, right, uh, a little bit as you increase it, then you see this transition from an FCC solid solubility to a BCC solid solubility, and it goes to this two-phase region with a rise in hardness along the way. So clearly it's important to know what phases are present because they can, like you see in this case, dictate materials properties. So unsurprisingly, in the 20 years, I guess 18 years since the discovery of these materials, there's been quite a bit of work using different models, including machine learning models, to predict different phases that might form. You know, here's half a dozen, but there's many, many more in the literature. So we're just gonna walk through some of these and you can see what's happening in the literature, what's good, what's bad, what sort of things uh, can you build on if you're gonna work in this area. So let's take a look at this first one, paper by Islam in 2018. So their task was to classify amorphous versus single phase solid solution versus intermetallic phases, right? So it was a categorization problem, right? They're gonna classify it into one of three categories. Um, now, what data did they use? They used data from Guo and Lee's 2011 Progress in Natural Science Materials International paper. This had 118 multi-principal element alloys, right? So these HEAs get all these different names, multi-component, medium entropy, high entropy alloys. We're gonna call them HEAs, but you will see other acronyms like MPEAs thrown around, but they're talking about similar classes of things, right? In that data set, there's 118 data points, but it wasn't balanced, right? There's 33 amorphous, 64 that were solid solutions, and 21 that had intermetallic. So that's our first challenge, is that you have an unbalanced data set, which is very often the case in material science, right? So what models and features did they use? They modeled this with a neural network, one that had an input of five dimensions, an output of three, right? Because you're classifying it into one of three categories. Um, two hidden layers with 10 nodes each. They used ReLU activation function. And then the features that they used were things like valence electron count, the difference in electronegativity, I think it was the difference in the size that delta, I think it stands for the, 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 or the, the difference of the average radii, I can't remember what it was in their paper, but it had something to do with size, unsurprisingly, um, the delta H of mixing and the delta S of mixing. And what were their findings? They found that their model was so, you know, quote, 83% accuracy overall. So code and data were not provided. Total bummer. And my comments about this, well, first off, it's an unbalanced data, and they didn't try and augment their data in any way to try and balance it. This was a really small data set, right? 118 to be doing a neural network. That's really small. Um, there was no test set used, which if you've watched our videos in the series, you know that I feel strongly that that's just almost a useless study then because all you've done is memorize your data set. You haven't shown how generalizable it is to any other task and you haven't provided the code or data anyways. So not like anybody could build on this easily. So not very useful. They did just do cross-validation in fourfold CV. 
and then they only reported an overall accuracy, not a per class performance. But if you're trying to make this prediction, I'm thinking that people would use this algorithm to then try and predict what we want to make a single phase solid solution, then what you really care about is the performance on the solid solution class, right? So a breaking up your performance into a per classes base, class basis would be really useful here, okay? Now, why these features, you might wonder, like why did they use those features, the valence electron count, electronegativity? Well, it comes from what we know about solid solubility. If you go back to the hume rothery rules, this is from the Wikipedia article, we know that whether or not materials form a solid solution can be, well, there's four general rules that hold, and there's exceptions, right? But in general, the radii of the solvent and solute should be close to one another. In fact, if they deviate by more than 15%, we often don't see extended solubility. The crystal structures of the solute and solvent should be similar, and if not, then they're not typically soluble. Um, we typically see that they're better when they have similar valence, hence why they're using valence electron count. Um, and then when they have similar electronegativity, because if there's a big difference in electronegativity, they're more likely to form intermetallics, right? It's going to form a new compound. So it's not surprising when you look at that that they're seeing valence electron count, electronegativity, and size as key factors. And then because the early papers really suggested that they thought that entropy, specifically the configurational entropy of when you form this mixture of many different components, was a stabilizing force that per, that was basically more, it allowed the solid solubility to be more favorable from an energy standpoint than the intermetallics. That's why they started using things like delta S mix and delta H mix as features. Um, okay, so they use those five, uh, and you know, the papers, there's been a lot of papers on ML, and this is a review of them, and they basically point out that, yeah, those are really common features for many people to use when they're doing ML for HEAs. They use these thermodynamic features, things like, you know, average volume and stuff they throw in there. Atomic level descriptors like the ones we've described. They will sometimes use physical descriptors like density, modulus, vaporization heat, thermal conductivity. Obviously, they break that down on a per element basis. So if you've got a formula, they break that down into averages or ranges or variances, depending on what they're particularly doing. And then they might even include environmental descriptors if you're looking at properties, right? So it's not just strength, it's maybe strength under irradiation, so that you need to featureize that, for example. So those, not surprising that those things sort of show up and they show up over and over in the literature, those types of ones, and you'll see them again. Now remember, they talked about accuracy, and accuracy and loss are not the same thing, right? So for example, when you're doing classification, oftentimes people will use a cross entropy as opposed to just straight accuracy, because it tells you something different, right? Consider these two scenarios that I took from this uh, website here, where they say, all right, sample one, two, and three, their ground truth is that they all belong to category A, right? But if you look at the, what the model's predicting, it's not like it was 100% sure that they belong to category A. In fact, in two of the scenarios, it had 70% confidence. But in the third scenario, it was basically even, and a slightly rounded up, it predicted category C. So accuracy of that would be yes, yes, no, because accuracy just says, did it get it right? Whereas the cross entropy does more than that. It says, let's actually calculate that based off of the probability of the different predictions of each category. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna sum up for these different things, you're gonna sum up the log of that probability in that class, right? So that changes your calculation. Your, your loss, if you're using cross entropy as a loss, is a much more useful metric maybe here than just the straight accuracy, right? And you can see these different scenarios where they do that. Okay, and then why do you care about a per class classification? Well, because if your classes are highly imbalanced, which they almost always are in material science, then the metrics can fool you. For example, this came from a paper of ours that we put out in 2018, where we were trying to predict crystal structures for basically everything. And so what we found is that there's you know a couple dozen common crystal structures, and then a whole bunch, like 10,000 that are basically super, super, super unique, where there's only one or you know less than 10 members of that crystal structure family. So if you're gonna try and predict that structure, you couldn't, because you, know, you don't have enough data to train on. So what we did instead is we tried to predict the common ones, we tried to classify those ones, and then everything that wasn't common, we just put it in the other category. And unsurprisingly, if you look at this, look, there's like 21,821 total other category materials, right? And so that's way more than any of these other ones, where there's just not that many of them. And so what would go wrong with this is like, okay, if your model was just using accuracy overall, what it would learn to do really quickly is always say that it's other. It would never even try and predict the other classes, right? The different classes, because it would get like 99% right just by predicting other every single time. 
So that's a broken classifier, right? So in some cases, it doesn't make sense for you to uh, rely on a single metric like that. You need to break it down on a per class basis. And I think that that would have been a good example in this last one where they had three classes and really you care maybe about one class more than the others in terms of practicality, okay? All right, let's move to the next paper. This one comes from uh, Huang in 2019, Actimat. Uh, so again, their task was similar as before. This time they're gonna classify single phase solid solution versus intermetallic phase versus mixed. So they're not trying to predict amorphous anymore, but they do wanna know, is it gonna be a mixed phase? Is it gonna be just intermetallic or just a solid solution, okay? And the data they used is different. They've moved to Senkov's paper. Miracle and Senkov wrote this 27 Actimat paper where now they have 648 curated compounds. Well, 648 uh, data points that they curated down to 401 by removing duplicates, I think they said. And it's also unbalanced. If you look at it, it's 174 solid solution, 54 um, intermetallic, and 173 mixed. So it's not balanced. And they tried a couple different models. They tried k nearest neighbors with you know different values for the k between one and ten, both fine and weighted. They did a support vector machine with one, two, and n-dimensional Gaussian kernels. And then they tried neural networks with looks like three hidden layers, five inputs, because again they're using the same five features as we saw in our previous one, and they're doing three categories at the end. So similar-ish deep learning approach. They've got more data though this time, still small, right? If you're doing 400 data points, neural networks questionable whether that's going to outperform the other ones and if it is it's questionable why so the first thing i notice here is that again they did not use a test set they did use cross entropy on the validation set but they didn't do a true test set so they were basically memorizing their data which unsurprisingly then yeah the neural network does great because you're memorizing your data right would it generalize to unseen data well i don't think so um but because they didn't provide their code or their data uh, we can't actually see and test for ourselves so bummer Shouldn't have done that. Um, they didn't try and balance their data with any sort of augmentation. Um, classes weren't balanced. Um, no per class performance was reported, just like before. Um, I, they did note that they, when they broke the problem into binaries, I can't remember which two, but basically, like, okay, is it solid solution and uh, is it like put these two together versus that one? I think is what they basically did. It did slightly better, which is not surprising because you made it from a three category classification down to a two. So, sure, it did a little bit better. And then they did report feature ablation to get the feature weights to get some idea of, of those five features, which ones are most important. And they found that the radii was the most important, followed by valence electron, followed by entry of mixing, followed by uh, enthalpy of mixing, followed by the difference in electronegativity, right? Now, you'll notice that. We start to see more papers that do feature weighting, and they don't always get the same trends. They're actually, I don't want to say all over the place, but they vary significantly. Okay, how about this paper? So this was a 2019 paper by Li and all, uh, Li and Guo. So again, they're trying to classify. They're using a classifier to predict BCC versus FCC versus no formation of a solid of a solid solution. Okay, so three categories again. They're also using Miracle and Sankoff's 2017 Actimat paper for their data. They curated it down to 322, where they've got 18 that were BCC, 43 FCC, 281 mix, so quite imbalanced data set. The model they used was a support vector machine with a radial basis function kernel. They used the same stuff as before, but they started to add a few other things. First off, they did the variance in the size and the variance in electronegativity, and they added melting point, okay? Um, how'd they do? They report a performance of 90%, um, they also then go on to then predict 31 new refractory HEAs, and they actually test out um, 11 of them experimentally and 20 uh, via DFT to actually validate how well their model did. So some experimental validation or simulation uh, validation went along with this. They did not provide their coder data, that form. Um, so my comments on this are that, again, it was a quite unbalanced data set they at least had a test set. They had 10% of their data set aside as a true test set, supposedly. I can't tell because they didn't provide it to make sure, but they said that they had that, and they did a cross entropy. Um, they did something interesting here. Even though it was unbalanced data, and it was highly unbalanced in terms of the elements, what I mean by that, if you look over here, if you look at the entire data set that they trained from, and you look at which elements are most prevalent, iron and nickel are the most common, followed by like aluminum and cobalt, but some other things like these ones, the, you know, the REHEAs are much less common there's very few examples of them. So, you know, this is, I think, a big problem in materials informatics where you might get really good performance if you are predicting near a certain chemistry. But if you're moving away from things to more unknown chemistries, you might actually not do well at all. This is why we did things like the Discover algorithm in our group, which, you know, you can read about. 
um, because I, I think this is a real problem of not having good balance. I like that they visualized this and we're at least thinking about that. And they did try and balance their data set in terms of the different classes, because again, it was 1843 and 281, not very balanced. They did SMOTE oversampling. If you're not familiar with SMOTE, it's essentially, um, it takes your data points where you don't have enough of them and it takes, okay, take this data point that we need more of and we take the four or five or X number around it and you're going to randomly pick of those and you're basically going to create a new one in between those two data points. You create a feature vector that is basically in between two of your known ones. So it is a way of augmenting your data to oversample different classes all the way up so that they had 261 of each. Um, and then they did report their performance on a per classes basis, which is good. They got the delta H mix from DFT. Um, they only considered the as cast. They excluded the rare earth elements and light elements, except for aluminum. Um, they didn't consider HCP uh, and other phases that technically can form as well, right? Um, and then they got their feature importance, which was slightly different than what we saw before. This time they say valence electron count is really important more important than the variance in the size, more important than basically everything else. And they found that like, variance in electronegativity actually wasn't all that useful. So it kind of, I think these were the same first two, but in different orders as our last paper. Okay. How about this one? Paper by Zhang, 2020, and Actimat. Their task was, well, they did two tasks. First task was, okay, does it form solid solubility or not? Presumably, does it form in metallics if it's not, right? And then the second task was, okay, if it does form solid solubility, is it FCC, BCC, or mixed? Right? Those were the two different tasks they did. Uh, in terms of data, they said that they found 550 samples from literature but didn't say anything about where they came from. So they didn't cite the papers, they didn't say anything. So they have data of unknown origin. They obviously don't provide the data. And they list, well, they say that it will be made available on request, which is not adhering to fair you know, data policies, but the field is slowly getting better. It's not here yet. Um, what about models? They did a couple things. They did a genetic algorithm. This is this relies on sort of natural selection. We've talked about this before. Um, it does it based off of many simple models. So if you have many simple models, you could combine them together in some way to get the best performer was their concept. Um, to do this, they also had 70 features. So instead of just the five that you've seen in the last couple of papers, they've now greatly expanded this to many other things. Some stuff from DFT, right? The you know different energies, cohesive energy stuff, dielectric, phonons, things like that. And some of the other stuff is more on the atomic level, but they've now expanded their feature pool greatly. Um, they do report that they used a 10% test set. And when you look at their findings, they claim that they get 88.7% accuracy on the first task and 91% accuracy on the second one. Um, so my thoughts on this, not having the data or code is obviously means that I don't know what to believe or anything about this because you, know, you can't see it for yourself. Um, I wish we'd have known where the data actually came from. It is not surprising that a genetic algorithm did well, though. Genetic algorithms are pretty great in terms of finding the best solution, and it comes at the expense of time. They can be very time-consuming to train. Um, and I do wonder how much improvement is actually coming from overfitting. Um, if you look at the common features here, these were you know, a mix of many of them. It's stuff we've talked about, electronegative difference, atom radii difference, melting point. Uh, this this omega parameter, this geometric parameter, stuff that we've seen before, essentially. And then the genetic algorithm approach was kind of interesting, right? So the way that it essentially starts, it says, okay, if you've got 70 different features, we don't want to use 70 because here they show here that like the accuracy of their model, it basically saturates after you've got four or five features. So there's no point in adding 70 features because it's just going to be more prone to overfitting. So to try and limit that, they're going to say, let's limit it to four features, right, where we're going to be less likely to overfit. Good idea. So how do you pick which four? The way that they picked which four was by this genetic algorithm, which is going to rely on mutation, crossover selection, all the stuff that happens in regular genetic algorithms to figure out which four should be used. So they did this by forming 100 solutions, which are 100, you know, four feature subsets of the 70 that they could pick, and they're going to have them compete against one another. So they figure out the cross-validation score for all 100 of those potential solutions, and then they start combining them together. They do tournaments, they, they take two of them, and they say, which one's better? And they find the best one, and they use this to identify the parents. So now that you've got parents identified from your solution population, you're now going to combine those parents together. Maybe this one used these four features, but these ones use these four. You're going to combine them together, Right, and you're going to figure out. They do this using 80% of the population's parents. They're when they combine those together. Now you've got too many features. They they only wanted four, and now you might have more than four turned on. So they reduce that down to four again, 
Okay? And then they apply mutations, right? So when they do mutations, it's this bit flip mutation. They turn on or off a feature as one that they're going to use on 1% of the genes. And then they, again, filter it so that you only have four max. So interesting approach to compete for which features should matter. And it, you do this process over and over. In this case, I think that, yeah, there's 50 genetic algorithm runs on each ML model type. So that's a lot of training, right? Because for each one of those, you have to evaluate the ML algorithm with those features. So this can be very time intensive, but unsurprisingly, it's going to give you sort of the best possible performance. And then ideally, you would take these and test them on a test set only once at the end. We don't have the code, so we don't know if they actually did that, but that's what they claim to do. Um, and then what's kind of interesting is they actually did this in an active learning framework where they used bootstrapped uncertainty. If you don't know what bootstrapping is, go back and watch our previous video on it. When we talk about ensembling methods, we covered bootstrapping. But it is essentially a way to give you a, a measure of uncertainty. And then using that, they can find the regions where they have the most uncertainty. And maybe they could bias their next experiment to explore those regions with high uncertainty. And you can see that in the two tasks, they had two different classifier models. You can see the before versus after when they only added 10 new samples. Remember, they had a couple hundred, so 10 is not like a huge increase. But they can substantially maybe increase the performance of these by looking at regions of uncertainty. They can better classify. So that's cool. All right, how about this paper? This is from Lee. It's a 2021 paper in Materials and Design. Their task was what we've seen before. They're trying to classify solid solution, intermetallic, mixed, or amorphous. So this time it's a four-category classification. And they use different data. Uh, they took from a couple different sources listed there, and they had 989 data points after they did some duplicate curation. So that breaks down into four different categories, 250 solid solution, 267 um, mixed, 307 intermetallics, and 165 amorphous. So now they've got a slightly different problem, slightly harder, four categories, but more data. And they're getting to the point where maybe at 1,000, these deep learning approaches make a little more sense, although really the cutoff is oftentimes higher than a thousand. It could be a couple, but let's see how they do. They, they're going to compare deep learning. Um, they did drop out. They kept batch sizes small. If you look at that, they've got 13 coming in, so their feature set must have been 13 things. They have one, two, three, four, five hidden layers, and then three at the end instead of four. I wonder if that's a typo on my part, but they drop it out. I, I assume that is meant to be four at the end. Um, and then, so that was with that. Then they also did a really clever GAN approach. More on that in the next slide. But they used a generative model. You might be wondering, what are they doing generative here? Because they're trying to classify. So what's the generative model doing? More on that in a second. And then they used the typical sort of features, slightly expanded. But it's mostly the stuff that we've seen before, just slightly different versions. So instead of just taking, for example, the variance in the electronegativity and size, they also looked at standard deviations in terms of melting point and modulus and a few things like that. So how'd they do? They report that their deep learning model had 84% accuracy versus only you know, 64 to 72% on classic models. Um, I don't know if they used a test set here. I didn't write it down, so I'm assuming they didn't have one. Unfortunately, it's another one of those papers where it says the data in this manuscript are available from the corresponding author on reasonable request, which, by the way, studies have shown that people don't actually provide the data. Oh, by and large, overwhelmingly, they never provide the data. Like Actual studies have tried to get people to send the data and kept track of whether they did or didn't. So that is not fair data policy. You should not do that. Just provide your data right? and code. Um, something else good that they did, though, is they did do Bayesian hyperparameter tuning. As they tune their models, instead of just doing grid or random search, we've talked about this, that um, Bayesian optimization is easy, first off, nowadays, and better. So really no reason not to be doing it. And they did that. It's nice. They did L2 regularization and dropout, things to try and help prevent overfitting, which is good. They also found that stability was better when their batch size was a bit smaller, like less than 30. Then this is what I think is slick. They used their generative model for data augmentation, and they saw an improve in the performance when they did that. Uh, more on that in the next slide. And then the last thing is that they did feature weighting with layer-wise relevance propagation, a different way to get feature weighting out of it. So. First off, when it came to tuning their model, there's grid search, which is not efficient. Maybe this is the best in terms of some hyperparameter. Random search is, is more efficient, but Bayesian is an awesome way to do that. So good move on their part, tuning their model. Now, nowadays, really, everyone should be doing this. Now, the generative model, if you're not familiar with generative adversarial networks, go back and watch our video on generative adversarial networks where we had Ryan Murdoch talking about their use. But really quickly, 
The idea here is that you are going to pit two neural networks against one another, and you're going to tie them together with a single loss function so that the back propagation affects both of them. So that basically, as the generator makes better fakes, the discriminator has to do better at fixing the real ones from the, at determining which ones are real, which ones are fake. So why do you want to do this? Well, they did it for data augmentation, right? So again, look here on the left. You've got these data points where these are two different, oh, they did two different categories, solid state versus mixed, it looks like. So the blue and the red are the two different categories. And then the black ones here are things that they got misclassified. They should have been one, but they got misclassified into the other. So to make their model perform better, I think they must have assumed, well, we just don't have enough data in that region. So what they did is they used a generative model to create more artificial data, augmented data, right, so that it could better learn from those. Um, and what they see, if you look at it, so here's the baseline performance. It did 84% baseline. As they start to use this generative model to make new fake compounds, shown up with these plus signs, these are the generated ones. As you do that, you can start to see that when they only added 25, it got better, 50, it got better, 100, it got better, 150, it reached its max, and then it actually started to drop a little bit as you went to 200 new data, new data points. So this is a really cool observation for a couple things. First off, how do they know that what they're generating is similar? Well, if you look at the feature, these are these, uh, you know, whatever they're called, radii plots or whatever, where this are, they're real compounds and these are the generated ones. They look almost the same, so they're pretty sure that they're making things that are quite similar, right? That's a good thing. The feature, the fe I guess what this would be is like the feature, uh, like this similarity, the feature vector similarity of these things are quite similar is what they're visually showing us here. But why do you see an improvement only up to a point and then you see that it gets worse? What I think is happening is that GANs and other generative models do a good job of capturing from the bulk of your distribution. They do a bad job of capturing the tails. And so what I think what you're doing is by generating this data, yes, you are giving it more examples for it to learn from in the most common types. But you're, eventually, the improvement that you're going to get from adding more data in this augmented fashion is going to be offset by the fact that you're only adding data from the bulk and you're never actually adding from the tails. Well, very, not, not effectively adding. And so you might see that it gets better because most predictions happen in the bulk, but you're still going to do worse at the tails. And so I think that's essentially what you're seeing is that you're slightly overfitting to the most common types of compounds that the generative model is spitting out. And that's why eventually it reaches the point where it doesn't actually help you and actually starts to do worse. I could be wrong, but I think that's what's going on. It's a cool study. So I like that. I just wish that they would have fixed things like providing data and all that, but pretty slick. Um, and then again, so obviously they can make their generative models conditional so that not only they make a new material, but they make it such that it has some condition met, like it will be of a certain phase, like a solid solution. Maybe you wanted to increase more of your solid solution to balance it as opposed to the mixed. Well, they can do that. And if they look at their output, they're showing basically that they do a pretty good job at that, that when they, the actual phase was solid state, they predicted it to be solid state, or solid solution, sorry. And then the softmax output was like overwhelming, so their errors are quite small, is what they're reporting. And then you remember that they did layer-wise relevance propagation to get their feature weighting. So now they can say, of these, I think it was 13 features that they used, these ones were the most important three, and then these ones were in the middle, and these were the least important. It's nice because this gives you interpretability, right, as having this feature weighting. And you'll notice that, you know, delta S mix is not the most important. Delta H mix they found to be the most important in their model, followed by size. You remember some of the earlier ones that did feature ablation or other studies to get feature weighting said that electronegativity and difference electricity were quite high important. This one says that these are more important. So it's just not the same. Like some people said that these were less important. These folks show that they are more important. Does it depend on the task? Does it depend on the data? Yeah, you betcha. And these are not done on the exact same. So it's hard to say generally which ones are more important for HEAs because it, it varies. It, it keeps on varying. It's not like a, a constant. How about this paper? So it's another classifier. They're going to classify single phase solid solution versus non-single phase alloys again. This was by Yan in 2021, Kant Matsai. Um, full disclosure, I'm an editor there. I think it's a great journal. Um, they talked about the data, and uh, this must have been before I was editing because they did not provide their data in code. They said it's available on request, so unfortunate. And they say that they got their data from historical literature, but they don't say where they got it from. They didn't cite the papers or anything. But now they're up to 1,800 data points, 800 of which are solid solutions. Over 1,000 are non-solid solutions. So data sets are getting larger. They went out to test nine classical models, uh, and then they settled on gradient boosting. The features were the same stuff that we've seen before. 
Uh, these are the ones that I listed, these seven or so. Um, gradient boosting said that they got 97% performance with cross-validation on a training, and then in a test set they said they got 96%. That is suspiciously high if you ask me. That seems really high, although they claim that they've got a 20% data, but because without the code, it's hard to actually verify that. They had an emphasis in their data set on looking on oxidation-resistant HEAs. So these are RHEAs, refractory HEAs typically. So stuff like titanium, zirconium, hafnium, uh, niobium, tantalum, that stuff. There's more of an emphasis on those, they said. Um, they did not do a differentiation on which phases. They just said single phase versus not, basically. right? So it's also an easier categorization or classification problem. Uh, they then they used this model to then predict 100 new single phase uh, samples and experimentally validated 10 of them. And then they got feature scores from permutation importance method, all these different ways to get feature weighting, right? So looking at all these, and this is not even close to all of them, but this is half a dozen of, I think, pretty representative of what the field's doing. What can we learn about it? Um, what's missing? Um, code and data, clearly, because I didn't find a single one there, and if there's other out there, there's not. It's not the. It's not the norm, and it should be, to provide all of your code and data so people can build off it and verify what you did and catch errors and make sure there's no data leakage and basic stuff like that. It needs to be reported. How about this? Um, looking at balance of elemental constituents, at least one paper I saw was aware that this was an issue but didn't address it. Um, Looking at balance in your data, we have seen some approaches, like the GAN approach was clever, and there's been others I've seen. Um, I'd say that there, another thing that's missing is going beyond just classification of like, oh, this one has FCC and BCC. Could we actually regress to actually predict how much? That might be interesting follow-up, right? Um, true validation, I th I'd say f an emphasis looking at where the model fails is really over, oh, it's, it's missing in this field. There's a lot of emphasis on like, oh, it did great, and here's all these state-of-the-art metrics. But I think what is more interesting to many of us is not this chasing like one, two, three percent improvement on state of the art, but rather finding out where models fail in what we want them to do. And you see almost none of that. For example, in extrapolation or in unbalanced constituents, elemental constituents, that would be good additions to this. Um, and then I thought this was interesting. This came from a 2019 Nature Reviews paper, which was a great paper. If you're interested in this field, like go and read it. But they were pretty down on this ability to predict phases and come up with um, rules. They basically say, you know, numerous other studies have attempted to relate phase stability to parameters like our features that we've seen, size, valence electrons, stuff like that. Um, they say many of these treatments ignore formation enthalpies, which we've seen. Some did, but some didn't. Um, they, you know, makes them limited. They say that they construct empirical phase stability maps as functions of the above parameters. Critical values are then estimated. So that's basically saying machine learning, right? An empirical fitting to your data is machine learning. Um, and then they use something like feature weighting, in this case, critical parameters to figure out above or below you're going to see things. But they also point out that thermodynamic models also have their problems because they, you know, when you do a thermodynamic model like CalFAD-based approaches, you need to know what your competing intermetallic compounds are and consider their enthalpies, which they don't always do because they don't always know what's going to form. Um, so there's not a perfect way to do this, and they basically point out in this thing that this is like still a, a problem for this field, so there's more work to be done here, which is good if you want to work in this field. Phases and phase prediction is not everything, though. You maybe care about properties. For example, I've seen a whole bunch of people working on high-entropy alloys because they think that they're going to be the next generation of turbine engines. I think they might be. It's possible. All right, we're working on a different competing technology, full disclosure, on niobium ones, but maybe high-entropy alloys are the future because they do have remarkable properties. So it's not just about predicting phases we might want to be able to predict their properties too as we screen out new candidates. And that's going to vary pretty widely. If you look at all the different types of HEAs that have come up in the 20 years of, since their existence, right, there's quite a few different categories with really different properties. Like, take a look over here. Like, this is showing elongation versus stress, right, T ultimate tensile stress. And you've got, you've got a lot of different performers out here. And a lot of those, of course, are going to be related to the phases that are present, right? But um, this is still an I think an open problem on how to predict those properties. So if we jump in the literature and look at how has ML done to try and predict these things, here's just sort of a snapshot overview of another half dozen papers. We're going to try and see what types of things are they predicting, what types of models, what types of data practices, and what are they learning from them. So let's sort of dive into these. Here's our first one from Bhattacharya in uh, 2020 in journal Oxidation of Metals. So their task was not to do a classification this time. Now it's to predict a material property. Specifically, they want to predict 
constant of oxidation, the rate constant of oxidation. They claim that they build a data set of 30 references, they don't cite which, um, and they end up with 114 data points. They, as models, try a couple. They try gradient boosting, random forest, and KNN. Um, and the types of features that they use are not the ones we've seen before. These are very different ones. They're using composition. One would assume, um, I, when I first read that, I assumed that they're going to do like a composition-based feature vector. But no, it's like straight up composition. I think they like one hot encode composition. And then you've got your phases, time, temp, the environment in which the corrosion is taking place, the atmosphere, and then the mode, like is it cyclic or not, right? That's the stuff that they turned into features. And they report that their gradient boosted R squared was 0.92. They didn't do a test set. And critically, well, no test set is already critical, but additionally problematic is the fact that it doesn't look like they did any grouped by CV. But what they have in their data set is a bunch of compounds where you've got rate constants under certain scenarios but I don't see any evidence that they held out groups that are like very much the same. So if you go back to our heat capacity paper that we did, we, we the, at the very first time when my student came to me, he's like, look how great we can predict heat capacity at any temperature. And it was like R squared of like one basically. And we're like, no, nah, something's wrong then. We realized what we'd done wrong, and thankfully before we published it, is that we hadn't grouped things out correctly. So we were predicting, say, the heat capacity of alumina at 500 degrees Kelvin. But what we had in our training data set was the values for alumina at 400, 300, at 700, at 900. So what we were really doing is was interpolating between known data points for that compound. That's not what we thought we were building. In that model, what we thought we were building is something that could take in a new chemistry, a new compound, and a temperature and deliver you the heat capacity. But that's not what we were doing. We were doing a tight interpolation, meaning if you're missing a single data point in the middle, basically our model could fill in that gap in the middle. I'm afraid that that's what's happening here, that what they're, they haven't, in the paper indicated, and since they didn't provide the code or data, one can only assume that the high performance has to do with the fact that they didn't group things out to do true uh, testing on unique new formulas, right? So, in other words, this is not a useful model for anything. First, it's not provided, no one can use it. But even if they, had, if they hadn't done that group by CV, all they've done is an interpolative model that, given the data, if you take a single data point out, can your model learn to fill in that, that one data point among other points in that family? That looks like what's happening. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, especially because these predictions were done as a function of temperature, right? So it very, makes a lot of sense to me that they probably had like a sequence of temperature data points. They randomly did a cross-validation, so they randomly took a data point out and then were predicting it, and that's just not useful. The composition, origin, and the balance of the data set, none of that got assessed. Um, the data was experimental. Um, it was unclear if they had data leakage, though, for reasons that I just talked about, and there was no test set. So... In my view, it's not a useful paper, right? Because I don't know what to, I can actually learn from this or actually use it for. How about this one? This is from George, uh, 2019 paper. Uh, George et al. This is an actimat. So they were now trying to predict bulk and shear modulus for HEAs and then use that to predict hardness. Now, I'd say the broader thing that essentially they ended up testing was whether or not you can train data on non high entropy alloys, right? Train on a bunch of regular old inorganic materials and then pr use that pre-trained model to predict HEAs and how do you do. They don't explicitly state that, but that's what they did because the data they had was bulk and shear modulus from DFT properties, from the materials project, right? They had 6,826 ordered inorganics, which are not HEAs, right? And yet that's what they trained on. So they built a model. In this case, they used a gradient boosted tree. They did a 20% test set, blah, blah, blah. They, they followed more or less practices except they never provided their code and stuff, data, which is broken record on this, but you have to do that. Um, they stated that they're combinations of density, group number, size, and electronegativity, but because we don't have exactly what they did, it's hard to know what features they really used. And they ultimately report, hey, that we did amazing, that they have less than 5% error on bulk modulus, less than 10% error on shear modulus, which, first off, there's been a lot of papers out there that have already done bulk and shear modulus predictions. We did one, right? When we discovered two new super hard materials, we trained on ordered inorganics in materials project as well, and we got similar performance. So not surprising, but it's also been done a long time ago. So this is essentially redoing what's been done before. But what would be interesting is then saying, okay, let's say you do build a model off of that. Will that model work to predict HEAs? And it would, be a, it would have been really interesting to actually validate that, but it's their, their analysis leaves something to be desired. First off, they, I, I'm not sure what they were doing with this. They did a bunch of DFT to look at variance in elastic moduli and the different uh, 
elastic tensor components. Not totally sure why, because ultimately what they came up with was this, right? They said, okay, we're going to make three values on experimental HEAs, this compound. Aluminum, where that can have a varying amount. Chromium, cobalt, iron, nickel. So similar to the, to the yay alloy, not quite, though. Um, they basically said, okay, in this one, we're going to vary the amount of aluminum, and experimentally, we can measure its hardness, and they did. So those are the experimentally measured value. And they can use their, their machine learning model to predict bulk and shear modulus, and therefore they can calculate using an empirical relation, which is pretty well known, what the hardness should be. And they're like not really particularly close. The trend is kind of right. It increases and slows as it increases from three data points, and that's kind of what they see here. But they like declare victory about this, and I'm just like, I don't know, that's not very compelling to me. Three data points that are quite a bit off, and the trend is ish right, but only three data points? I don't know. This would have been a really interesting study if they would have looked at overall the performance on many different HEAs, not just this single one that was quite a bit off, but in general, can you transfer learn from inorganic compounds to some other, a different data set, in this case an HEA data set? That would have been really interesting, but with three data points, I don't think you can really draw any real conclusions here. That's my takeaway. If you look at like how their, um, if you look at the measured neutron, the neutron diffraction, the shear and bulk modulus, and compare that with theirs, benchmarked versus this work, it's basically not like, it's, it's just all, it's not really better. Like, it's as good as the other one, I would say, not really better. That's my takeaway. How about this paper? This comes from Chang in 2019 in, uh, it's the journal, okay, in JOM. Okay, so this time they're trying to predict hardness. So they were seeking mixtures in a certain material family. I think maybe they were trying to get a better elemental tightness, right, where they're trying to balance the constituents a little bit better. So they were specifically looking for aluminum, cobalt, chromium, iron, nickel, and manganese, right, mixtures of those. Uh, but they found 632, but then only 25 of those were synthesized in the way that they were interested. So I think vacuum arc melting. So then they added copper and molybdenum to get that number up to 91. So the data set's relatively small, 91. And yet they did a neural network um, with 24 inputs. So I can't remember, because I don't think it even said what the features are. I'm pretty sure it did not state what the features were, but they had 24 of them. And then they did you know, a neural network, which is a 24-3-1 with a predicted hardness. They report this absurdly high R-squared value, if you ask me. Um, there's no code and almost no description even in the paper of like what they did, but no code or data is provided. And then it says element, you know, I, I, my notes were that there was elemental and complexity imbalance, no idea what the data was taken from. Um, they claimed that they did bootstrapping of 100, 512 different neural networks to get uncertainty measurements. And then critically, this, this jumped out at me. Like they say, you know, up at the top, this is good. They say from a tools design problem with the limited data set that's being considered here, you know, that they only have 91. They recognize it's a small data set. And then they say, pursuing accuracy with a small amount of data often risks reducing generality. Completely agree. If you try and like chase just accuracy, but you've got a tiny amount of data, it's probably not gonna generalize to new data, right? It's not gonna be a generalizable model. And so, so this work intentionally proceeds with mild underfitting to trade accuracy for generality. So they know what they want to do. They know that they want a generalizable model and that overfitting is not useful. And so they used a neural network with 91 data points, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me with 24 different inputs. Anyways, that's still going to overfit like crazy, it seems to me, but that's what they chose to do there. How about this one? Uh, this is a paper by Gao in 2020 in the journal, Journal Alloys and Compounds. They were trying to do something different that we hadn't seen before. This time they're trying to predict the uniaxial twinning volume, right? The stress strain and the texture evolution. So this is way beyond just like a single property. They're trying to get like a more comprehensive mechanical performance. Um, now their data set was also humongous, but it was very specific to a very single material basically. In the end, ended up with over 800,000 different things to train from. But that came from different simulations of 500 grains, 126 different data points along the stress strain curve that they're going to try and predict, 13 different strain rates. And this did also include six that were experimentally measured stress strain things. Um, the approach that they used was a genetic algorithm, artificial neural network, which is Instead of using gradient descent and backpropagation to tune your weights, they use a genetic algorithm. So it's a slower but tend to be more accurate genetic algorithm, uh, uh, neural network, I mean. Um, the features that they use were the same stuff that most of these studies use, the typical ones. Uh, and then if you look at the 
the their findings well first off in terms of time they show that in less than two seconds for the ml models you know compared to 15 to 890 seconds if you're doing a more classical simulation for example crystal plasticity finite element modeling which depends on a mesh right so if your mesh is really coarse then it might be as fast as 15 seconds if it's really really fine and therefore better accuracy it might be really long but in any case ml is doing it faster and then if you look at the actual values they got for their stress strain, they're saying that their mean squared error is negligibly small. Same thing with calculating the texture and the twin volume. So these always look too good to be true to me when I see this, when it's just like that good. And sure enough, they don't provide their code and data, so you can't test it yourself. But then looking into it, I realized what they did. They did have a test set, but what they did, remember there was 13 different strain rates, which ranged from like really slow strain, like they're going to strain this crystal really, really slowly all the way to straining it really fast, and they're going to try and predict the stress strain response. Their test set was just one of these strain rates. They held out epsilon dot equals 10 per second. So at 10 hertz, that is their test set. In other words, they trained off of all these really, really slow ones, and then right in the middle, that's their test one they held out, and then they trained on all the really, really fast ones. So again, what they've done is they've built a model that given all this data for straining it really slowly and all this data for straining it really fastly, can you predict a single strain rate in the middle? Well, technically it might be like 10% of your data. It's a very tight interpolation of the data that you have. So, so are these, I don't know, when I see these numbers in terms of performance, you might think that that means that it's like this, for, you know, you're gonna be able to put in any HEA, put in the crystal structure, and it's gonna spit out all these things you care about, like the volume of twinned regions, the stress strain, or the texture, and get this um, also amazing performance. And that's not the case, because what they did was a tight interpolation of a very narrow range when they had a ton of data around it. So I don't know. That's just like not an at all generalizable model for anything. Sure, it proves the concept that given a ton of data before and after a strain rate, can you fill in the gaps with ML model? Sure. And it will be faster than crystal plasticity fine element model, but to what end? Like, what's that doing for you? Not to mention the fact that their genetic algorithm to train this was also really slow, which I don't think they included in the time calculation. So I don't know. At first I was excited about this, and then the more I read it, I'm just like, sure, they did a thing, but it, it's not useful for anything, it feels like to me. It's not generalizable in any way. How about this one? This paper by Aurora in, uh, what's the journal? In Metals, an MTPI journal. So this was a 2020 paper. They are trying to predict stacking fault energies. So the data, it varied from 20 to 200 structures of different supercell types. So when you do simulations, any simulations, you have to make different supercells because HEIs are disordered. So to simulate them, you typically need to make a big uh, unit cell, a supercell, and then you look at average response across that big thing. And so the bigger you make it, the more accurate it should be. So their supercells range from 48 atoms to 480 to 6,000 to over 100,000, so really big, down to small. I think what they were trying to do is basically test the, this following. They want to say, if we train on a bunch of small models, can we use an ML approach to then extend that, extrapolate that to a, a larger supercell? Because this presumably is really slow to calculate, but training it on a bunch of these is fast. So then you use ML to fill in the gaps, right? I think is what's happening. Same thing with ML models on, what if you train on a bunch of binaries? Could you then use ML to extrapolate out to ternaries, right? This seems to be what they're kind of after. It was not super clearly written. The models that they use, they use linear models, ridge and lasso, so simple linear models. Um, if you look at the features, it's the type and number of local bonds. So inside these um, superstructures, you're going to look at the local environment, right? And they're going to quantify that. So the way they did that is that they did it in by looking radially outwards in increments of 0.1 angstroms from 1 up to 7 and they kept track of the nearest neighbors in some way and featureized that. It was not totally clear, and since they didn't provide the code, who knows what they did, right? Um, anyways, they find that on going from training on 480 atoms, it sounds like, and then, it, then predicting on a larger one, like 4,000, that they get perfect accuracy, which is a huge red flag for anybody in this field. But again, we don't have the code, so we don't know if there's data leakage or what's going on. Um, so my comments on this, so they were specifically trying to use ML to generalize, which I think is a good thing, but then they, I don't think that they did a good job of it because we don't know exactly what they actually did. But the concept of training on something small and seeing how it can extend out to large, especially using simple models like linear ones, is a sound one. We know that it is possible to extrapolate. If you don't know that, go back and watch my previous video in this series on extrapolation. We also showed that linear models tend to do a better job with extrapolation. Um, 
Anyway, so they do claim that they had a 20% test data set, but because none of the details are given, I'm just skeptical, especially when I see this performance. Um, who knows how they actually did j data generation or splitting? It wasn't clear. Okay, how about this one? This comes from Lee, and uh, here they're trying to you know, do predictions of, this came from, by the way, the Journal of Material Science Technology in 2021. They're trying to predict the ultimate tensile strength using MD simulation data. So they did MD simulations in one family, basically, and they varied the composition a little bit in the chromium, cobalt, nickel family. And they came up with 186 MD simulations. They took that very small amount of data and <laughs> ran it through a neural network, questionable, with features, no features. They just one hot encoded the elemental amount. So they didn't do, you know, this is a very deep learning approach without a lot of data, which is hazard. They report an R squared. Um, there is, they technically claim that they've got 45 data points in their test data set, although I don't think it said how they were separated. And since this is all in the same family, this is like an interpolation problem. Uh, it'd be very surprising to see a lot of variance. In fact, they don't, you don't see that in the next, in, if you actually look at the data, they don't vary that much. So I don't know how generalizable or useful this is to anybody else that wants to build on this. And again, no data, no data and no code was provided. So. My hunch here, given that score, is that this is likely just an overfit niche example of them memorizing their data, probably. Um, they, you know, if you did get a model that you believed these scores, which I don't, um, not, not generally on a new material anyways, then they said like, oh, you could actually extend this to then take into account predictions of strength, but then you could do these sort of phase diagrams which shows performance in the different HEA regions. Maybe your best performance is here, but you could always normalize that by things like density or price, and then maybe you'd be better off up here. Anyways, that was their sort of approach. Now, I don't want to be totally down on ML happening, <laughs> right, in HEAs. I've been critical of a lot of stuff, which is, I think, healthy, like moving the field forward. But there has been some genuinely really awesome stuff. And it's not always about predicting properties or faces. It's been doing unusual cool stuff. Like, take a look at this one. So I'd say what they're really after here is they're trying to see whether or not you can use a machine learning approach as a proxy, a fast, accurate proxy, for predicting something like an order parameter in high entropy alloys. So I was not familiar with order parameters, but as you, you might be familiar if you've taken a kinetics course that there's different order phase transformations, right? First order, second order, right? So there's this order parameter, which is related to, it, it's, an, it's an integer, or it's a number that is related to how disordered or ordered a system is. That's what this order parameter is. So if you take something that's very highly ordered versus something that's disordered, you'd expect different numbers for your order parameter. And the problem is with these HEAs where technically you have to just keep on doing bigger and bigger supercells to simulate how ordered they are is that it's unclear how big you should go for one thing. And so, and then they don't even have like a single value because the current state of the art proxy for an order parameter is this so-called warren Cowley short range order parameter. And what it basically does, it creates a matrix of, of your different components that are present. And basically it's one minus P sub L I J, which basically that's P sub L I J is the probability of finding I at the elf neighbor given an atom J and a concentration C I which is the concentration of your atom I. So it, it's, it's a matrix of your different atoms that are present. It says like, what's it, it's kind of related to order, but it's not perfect. The problem is that this gives you a matrix, it's not a scalar, and it's really unclear like how long range your calculations should be. So even if you did this, it can be slow and kind of a pain. So not a good approach, and it's not what we look for. Um, what would be great is if you had something else, right? Because let's say you had this really ordered compound, it's got a high you know order parameter as it transitions to a more disorder and eventually to a very disordered one, we would expect to see this order parameter drop. For example, upon heating, it goes from ordered to disordered. So what they do, which I think is so clever, is they use a variational autoencoder, where they basically say like, okay, a variational autoencoder, go back and watch my previous video if you can't remember them. It's a type of generative model which takes something like this structure here, it encodes it down to lower dimensions, right? You had this really big feature vector. It encodes it down into these dense layers. And then it does a sampling from the distribution. It, it, it encodes those to a distribution. And then with some tricks, which we talked about in our previous video, it can then sample from that distribution and then decode that back out to create new material. So the input looks a lot like the output. In this case, they say it did technically get things wrong. You can see that these atoms are slightly out of order. 
from what they were over here, but it did a pretty good job of encoding and decoding back out. There's always gonna be some loss, but you try and minimize that loss with your VAE, your variational encoder. Now, instead of just using this to generate new materials for augmenting data or for generative modeling or whatever it is, which is what I thought they were gonna do here, they don't do that. Instead, they say, hey, we flattened it down to this really low dimensional space. And then we can like, we can assign that basically a single value, which is gonna be related to the variation between your loss, like your DKL, right? So if you remember, go back and watch our previous video on this, the DKL loss is a, basically a measure of how similar these two distributions are, right? And so they state right here, they say, if we hypothesize that the symmetry, so it's gonna be related to the order, the symmetry of our input X is preserved by this latent variable Z, the DKL loss is minimized when the more symmetric phases are encoded into data points near the origin of the latent space. This is so clever. They said they used the fact that the power of the VAE to encode things down to low dimensional to get a single parameter out of it, and then they're going to show that that parameter might be a good proxy for order, and they show that it actually works pretty well. So here's that, that VAE determined Z value. And if you look at it, you'd expect it to go down when things go through transitions. And so the transitions happen in these pink regions with the blue as being an experimental value. And these are sort of like regions of, they think something's going on. Sure enough, they see that the VA is going down and then it sort of increases and then it goes down again. They see that it's rising there. It seems to coincide with where transformations are taking place, which is so cool. Then they did another thing. They actually did a, uh, an embedding. I, think, I don't know if it was TSNE or UMAP but they did an embedding technique and they showed that different classes of materials exist which might correspond to the different classes of structures that occur as you undergo different phase transformations. Really elegant, interesting approach to using ML in a unique and refreshing way. So if you actually look at this, um, I like this, this paragraph from the paper, I think is just terrific. So it says, although defined through neural networks, its physical uh, meaning is transparent and simple where the crystallographic symmetry during phase transitions is quantitatively preserved. It is surprising to see that the physical information can be so precisely preserved after going through this highly nonlinear neural network operation. This is an excellent example that demonstrates the power of ML to understand the physics in material science. Its power is far beyond its common applications as a, as a mathematical black box. More future studies are merited to fully explore its power. Such a great paper. And obviously, I love the fact that they include the first one that I think we're going to see in this whole 12 plus papers we've looked at today all their data and all their code elegantly laid out nicely commented great job to the folks at Oak Ridge National Lab that did a wonderful job on that so let's say a few more words about uh, interpretability before we call it a day on HEA ML modeling we we've seen that there's this relationship between hardness and which phases are present and we know from our basic understanding of slip systems of the the the, uh, the difference in the interstitial sites and the strain in the lattice as you start to strain them, why those would be correlated to hardness. And that's all about this concept of structure property relationships. And we've talked before about how important interpretable modeling is if you're going to try and learn new relationships. So what do we have available to us? Well, feature weighting is important. And we've seen a bunch of the studies have done that through ablation studies, through forward layer-wise propagation, through lots of different things. You will see a lot of this in literature when you start to look at uh, the ML literature for HEAs. A common tool is things like SHAP values. If you're not familiar with SHAP, um, I wasn't until not that long ago. It came out of actually economics. The, the guy won a Nobel Prize for it. It was a way of determining, it's based on game theory. It's basically, you take these features and you make a game out of it, like turning them on and off and you see what would be the impact B as you essentially turn them on or off or, or varied them. That's kind of the idea behind SHAP, the SHAP values. In any case, what they ultimately give you is not just a value, is it important, yes or no, which is good. It tells you more than that. It says under what conditions are they favorable or detrimental towards being correlated to your target of interest. That's more information, right? So for example here, here's a really good example of it. They're looking at the SHAP value where positive means it's correlated with the target, negative means it's anti-correlated with it. Um, and they do it for one feature here, the valence electron count, as a function of how much of that is present. So it's not just like, is it good, yes or no, which on average, if you look at this thing on average, it's like just as good as it is bad. And so it would be like an average value in terms of feature weight. But here they're showing that at low values, they're showing it's highly positively correlated. It's, at high values, it's negatively correlated. In other words, the VEC exerts positive influence on the hardness, that's their target here, when VEC is less than 7.5, but it's negative 
otherwise. And that's because the BCC solid solution is more stable when you are less than this. And we know that BCC phases are harder, so when this BCC is less than that, it's not surprising that intuitively we can mechanistically see why this is happening. Same thing over here, we see that BCC structures possess more severe lattice distortions compared to FCC leading to more solid solution strengthening. And then elements like aluminum, chromium, titanium, molybdenum, and vanadium have a lower valence electron count, and therefore this would if you increase their content, it's going to bring the VEC down and it's going to give rise to this higher hardness. So a cool way of getting understanding out of this. Here's another one. Now they're doing it with temperature, melting temperature. So shap values are basically indifferent below a certain value. There's just as many above as below. But then if you go towards higher values of this, it becomes strongly correlated. Um, which again tells you that alloys like titanium, molybdenum, molybdenum, chromium that have higher melting points are going to obviously be correlated to a higher hardness. So cool things. You can look at uh, feature importances and compare them across the board, like across different studies, and see is this a generalizable finding about features, or is it specific to this niche scenario? I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, and obviously comparing feature weighting is, is pretty interesting. You see counterintuitive examples happening all the time, like here's two totally different ones. Like the, the features that are important for predicting phases are these ones, like melting point, difference in electronegativity, uh, difference in melting point. Those are all really important in their model. But then you get totally different ones when it came time to predict Young's modulus. So it's not like there's one set that will always work. It might be property dependent and more likely data set dependent. So um, what else can we say about ML modeling of HEAs? Good news is that there's a large and now growing data set of HEAs out there. Here's five just from the last couple of years, from what, 2019 forward. You've got five great studies. This one from GE uh, in Data and Brief. Full disclosure, I'm an editor at Data and Brief and Comp Matt Sci, but I think that there are great databases out there and they're growing all the time. So it's becoming more and more easy and realistic to try and learn from large sets of data as they become more available. And then one last thing to talk about is let's say a few words about active learning. Ultimately, we are still going to be gathering more data, and it's likely that if you're in this field, you may want to find something that has property X or phase X, right? And so it's going to be an iterative process of trying to find it. What you're seeing is many times this iterative framework where you learn something via your machine learning surrogate model, and that helps you screen or search. You're going to use some sort of utility function that helps you prioritize what it is you're looking for. You're then going to make them, you're going to add them back into your data set and get better with each time. The most common way to do this is with something like a Bayesian optimization approach, right, where you have this really great tool for active learning because, remember, if you've gone back to our Bayesian optimization video, Gaussian processes, you know that they deliver uncertainties because they turn everything into distributions. If you've got a distribution with a mean and a norm, then you can, you've got your uncertainty built into it. So this allows you to then say, okay, if you're trying to max, the most common thing when we talk about a utility function is we'll say, let's say you have an expected improvement utility function, where let's say you're trying to maximize whatever this property is, f of x, hardness, right, or whatever else. If you want to maximize it, and this is the highest point in your data set, well, which point are you going to pick? Are you going to pick one that has a low value and high uncertainty? No, because its predicted value, its mean is low, but it has a high norm, right, standard deviation. Even better would be to pick something that's relatively high and has a high uncertainty, because maybe it's even better. Maybe somewhere here, maybe you could do better. Uh, that's the idea of this, uh, of, an ex of a utility function like expected improvement, which combines both exploitation, meaning pick things that already look like they're doing kind of good, with an exploration term, meaning pick regions where we don't really know what's going to happen. So that's become a very standard approach in these surrogate model active learning approaches. And here's an example of where they did that. They did, I don't remember how many different cycles, some number of cycles where they are iteratively gathering new data, and sure enough, they can do some feature, you know, down selection to build models. They can then screen over a large number of compounds. In this case, they screened like 1.8 million candidates in whatever this phase space is they're looking at. And sure enough, when they did a, a relatively low number of iterations, like seven iterations, they see that they're slowly creeping up on their hardness because they're using this utility function to really hone in on the property of interest. And you could obviously make this more than a single property. You could do multi-objective Bayesian optimization, which is... I think the future in a lot of these areas. So I hope this was useful. Um, it's not meant to be a completely comprehensive view of all the machine learning happening in HEAs. There's more out there. Um, but I think it gives you a flavor of what are the sort of tasks, um, data types, uh, problems, featureization techniques that you will see in this field if you dive into it. Let me know what I missed in the comments below. Let me know if I got something wrong. I hope I didn't throw shade on your work. I'm trying to be a dispassionate, you know, critical observer of this field in the hopes that we can all start to do a little bit better here. Um, and stay tuned for more videos coming soon.